what should have been routine flights moving football teams from one city to another turned tragic. As in the fall of 1970, only one month apart, two cities would lose a majority of their college football teams in separate plane crashes. Today, the crashes that claim the lives of Wichita State and Marshall University football teams in 1970. Sometimes the human mind goes to dark places. Sometimes those dark delusions turn into a reality. A reality so shaded and gray, once all is said and done, the healthy mind is drawn into the documented retelling of these tragic events, trying to find logic, reason, and understanding where there may be none at all. This is the dark side of Wikipedia. Wichita State. In clear and calm weather in Colorado, at 1.14 p.m. on Friday, October 2nd, 1970, a chartered Martin 404 airliner crashed into a mountain eight miles west of Silver Plume, operated by Golden Eagle Aviation. The twin-engine propeller carried 37 passengers and a crew of three. 29 were killed at the scene and two later died of their injuries while under medical care. It was one of two aircraft carrying the 1970 Wichita State Shockers football team to Logan, Utah for a game against Utah State. The second aircraft flew a conventional route and arrived safely in Utah. Pilot errors, including poor in-flight decisions and inadequate pre-flight planning, were officially reported as leading to the crash. About three months before the crash, Wichita State contracted Golden Eagle Aviation to supply a Douglas DC-6B to fly the team to away games for the 1970 season. The four-engine DC-6 was a large, powerful aircraft that could accommodate the entire team. Golden Eagle Aviation did not own the DC-6, but had an arrangement with the Jack Richards Aircraft Company to use it. After the agreements were made, the DC-6 was damaged and was unavailable for use. A pair of Martin 404s, which had not flown since 1967, were recertified for flight. On October 2, 1970, these were ferried from Jack Richards Aircraft Company facilities in Oklahoma City to Wichita. Instead, of the DC-6. Upon arrival in Wichita, the two aircraft were loaded with luggage. Passengers reported they took off and headed west to a refueling stopover in Denver at Stapleton Airport. From there, they would continue to Logan Airport in northern Utah. The two aircraft were dubbed gold and black after the school colors. Gold, the aircraft that later crashed, carried the starting players, head coach and athletic director, as well as their wives, other administrators, boosters, and family. The designated black plane transported reserve players, assistant coaches, and other support personnel. So this is something that... Obviously, if if you're around at the time, you would remember, but uh, if you had lived at any point in your life in Wichita, would probably also be aware of because it's something that is certainly talked about, a uh, big piece of, of their the history of the city and of the college. And the most notable thing that I, I noticed, because I did not know this story, honestly, until I lived, uh, I lived there and moved there. Uh, was there's a giant football stadium in Wichita, or at least uh, there was. I know that it's slated for demolition, uh, but you go and like, why is there a big football stadium with no football team? And then you find out that this happened and it never really got back up off the ground afterwards. Uh, there's more to this story. Tony and Carol Hughes joining you on today's episode of the program. What's, what's your recollection of this uh, looking back? I have no recollection. None? Um, I I went to Wichita State, and yeah. it was well past the time, obviously, that sure. that happened. But, so I never even knew about it until I started going to Wichita State. Okay. And they have a big monument on campus mm-hmm. about it. And so the football team probably went another 
12, 13, 14 years after that, mm -hmm. they were not good. Yeah. But they they did play football for quite a while after that happened. But it was, a, I mean, that's a devastating thing to happen to in any city, you know, but let alone a university where it's half your team. Yeah. You know? And they commemorate that every year at the memorial in on campus. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was just, I can't, and it was just so surprising to me because I was all excited about going to Wichita State. Like, what is this monument thing? And I remember asking what it is. And they're like, oh, that was for the, the Wichita State football team and mm -hmm. the plane that went down. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So I had never even heard of it until I started going to school there. Yeah. But I lived in Nebraska when I was a little kid. Sure. So, sure. And I would have been really young when that happened. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's just one of those things where you, you know, it, it, it's kind of just part of the, the history of the city. So you end up learning about it. If memory serves me correctly, wasn't maybe I'm completely wrong here. Wasn't there another plane that crashed like into a neighborhood in Wichita at some point in yes, time? Not very far away from there. Okay. And, that, and it was also northeast, not bar, not very far away from campus. Mm -hmm. I should have said. So it's it's in that part of town. I would say that plane crashed. I'm thinking that was in the '60s or '70s. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly when. I would say, you know, as a bird flies a mile or two from campus. Wow. And I think it was a. It was because we have an Air Force base here. And I yeah. think that plane had something to do with the Air Force base. Okay. What a lot of folks may not even realize is, I mean, uh, and I didn't understand it until I lived there either, is is all of the aviation that goes out of Wichita with Boeing and Spirit and Cessna and, and all that that's there. And one of the first, yeah. the, the first signs that was up in the airport, at the old airport when I landed there, uh, the 15 or so more years ago uh, was uh, the the air capital of the world. And I was like, am I missing something? <laughs> like, like that's, I, that's, I, that's what we're known as. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't realize it. They're like, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize how big aviation was there. Uh, but yeah, a huge, a huge thing. And one of the one of the more e cool but I will say this also kind of eerie things to see that uh, you, you'll see in Wichita if you're there for any uh, piece of time related to aviation is train cars going down the road carrying the the fuselage of airplanes uh, on rail cars. And it's just kind of like, well, that's weird. <laughs> you're for I will say since that, what, what is it? The 737 Max? Yeah. With Boeing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because a lot of that plane was has been built here. Sure. That's kind of slowed down. Yeah. To a screeching halt. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, sure. You're, but, yeah. But it, you still see them, but not like you did. Yeah. Because when they were really ramping up, I'm making those planes. It was just constant. You, you could sit at a stoplight and you would see like, 12 planes go right past you and there's no wings on these things and it's just yeah. the fuselage and the the window pretty cool actually yeah but you know it's an airplane and it's just this it's one of those strange it's like when you go on, on a highway and sometimes you'll see the uh big propellers for one of the uh the wind turbines that's always an interesting sight to see um but uh, seeing airplanes on a train is uh, is another one but anyway let's continue on with the story of this uh, plane crash in 1970 of uh, the Wichita State Shockers here on the dark side of Wikipedia. The president of Golden Eagle Aviation, Ronald G. Skipper, was the pilot flying Gold. Although occupying the left seat, he was acting in the capacity of the first officer because he did not have a type rating on the Martin 404. During the flight to Denver, he visited passengers in the cabin, advising them that after refueling, they would take a scenic route near Loveland Ski Area and Mount Sinicato. The proposed alpine skiing venue for the 1976 Winter Olympics, recently awarded to Denver in May. The other crew flying the black aircraft adhered to the original flight plan and took a more northerly route heading north from Denver to southern Wyoming, then west. Using a designated airway, less scenic 
This route allowed more time to gain altitude for the climb over the Rocky Mountains. While the aircraft were refueled and serviced in Denver, First Officer Skipper purchased aeronautical sectional charts for the contemplated scenic route. The National Transportation Safety Board investigation reported state that the first officer testified that he intended to use the charts to help point out landmarks and objects of interest to the passengers. The report concluded the crew did not allow enough time for the charts to be studied properly to avoid high terrain before takeoff commenced. After takeoff in clear weather, the two aircraft took divergent paths away from Denver. Shortly before the crash, several witnesses described seeing an aircraft flying unusually low towards the Continental Divide. Some witnesses located on higher mountainside locations, such as Loveland Pass at 11,990 feet, reported seeing it flying below them. Crash survivors Rick Stevens was a senior guard and stated in 2013, as we flew along over I-70, that there were old mines and old vehicles above us. I noticed we were quite a bit below the top of the mountains. I got up to go to the, po- the cockpit, which wasn't unusual to do at the time, and I could tell we were in trouble, looking out the window and seeing nothing but green in front of us. The overloaded aircraft nearing Loveland Pass as it flew up, Clear Creek Valley became trapped in a box canyon and was unable to climb above the mountain ridges. Surrounding it on three sides, nor complete a reversal turn away from a sharply rising terrain. At 1.14 p.m., the gold aircraft stuck, struck trees on the east slope of Mount Trelis, 1,600 feet below its summit, and crash. The NTSB report stated a belief that many on board survived the initial impact based on the testimony of survivors and rescuers. The load of fuel on board did not explode immediately, allowing survivors to escape the wreckage, but the passenger cabin was eventually consumed by an explosion before those still alive and trapped inside could escape. Of the total of 40 on board, the death count at the scene was 29, which included 27 passengers, captain and flight attendant. One of the deceased passengers was an off-duty flight attendant who was assisting. Two of the initial 11 survivors later died of their injuries to bring the death total to 31. 14 of whom were Wichita State football players. First to arrive at the crash scene were construction workers from the nearby Eisenhower Tunnel Project and motorists on US-6. The first officer and company president survived. He was flying the plane from the left seat. The NTSB report states that weather played no role in the accident. It lists the probable cause to be that the pilot made improper decisions in flight, or in planning. The intentional operation of the aircraft over a mountain valley route at an altitude from which the aircraft could neither climb over obstructing terrain ahead nor execute a successful course reversal, significant factors were the overloaded condition of the aircraft, the virtual absence of flight planning for the chosen route, a flight from Denver to Logan, a lack of understanding on the part of the crew of the performance capabilities and limitations of the aircraft, and the lack of operational management to monitor and appropriately control actions of the flight crew. The USU president, vice president, provost, athletic director, and athletic information officer were all unavailable in the immediate aftermath of the crash, leaving the game to be canceled by John S. Flannery, a USU information services employee. Utah State's football team held a memorial service at the stadium where the game was to have been played and place a wreath on the 50-yard line. Wichita State University officials and family members of the survivors were flown to Denver on an aircraft made available by, made available by Robert Docking, governor of Kansas. Classes at Wichita State were canceled from Monday, October 5th, and a memorial service was held that evening on campus at Cessna Stadium. The remaining members of the Wichita State team and the NCAA Missouri Valley Conference, allowing freshman players to fill out the squad, decided to continue the 1970 season. It was later designated the second season. Wichita State and Utah State had played in five of the previous six seasons, but never met again in football. Wichita State discontinued varsity football after the 1986 season. The accident was the first of two college football charter aircrafts to crash in 1970. Six weeks later, Southern Airways Flight 392 carrying the Marshall University team crashed in Huntington, West Virginia 
as the team returned from a game in North Carolina. And that part of the story we will get to in just a few moments. Thoughts on uh, everything that we just talked about? You know, it just makes me so angry because listening to all of that again, like it could have been prevented. Sure, completely. You know? And it just pisses me off. I can't, I couldn't imagine being a family member and hearing that. Was there ever um, lawsuits or anything that were, I, I, or was that more of a time where that didn't occur? I don't remember, but man, now that whole company would be shut down, you know? They'd be going after the people who made, you know, the seats, uh, <laughs> you know, just everything, you know, that's, that's how that works. But I'm surprised there was no uh, chapter in here about litigation um, after. there was. I sure don't rem- remember hearing about that. Yeah. But it's just so horrific. And the fact that they had the two planes, one of them does the right thing. And for whatever reasons, we're going the scenic route. Is aviation still that loose? Can you like that spur of the moment still decide, you know what? We're going to take the scenic route. I don't. Well, if it is, that's wrong. <laughs> but you don't hear of that sort of thing. I mean, I can see like if you're maybe more so like on, you know, experimental aircraft or something where it's like a two seater, you know, yeah, it, and planes that fly really low. Yeah. I don't think I can't think what you call them like a two seater plane. Yeah. But I, think I, you I can kind of change things as needed. But something where you're carrying, you know, essentially, you know, a, a large group of people. That's a, that's like a commercial aircraft at that point. I just can't imagine. But the fact that they went on and continued with that football season, that's unreal. I can't imagine what that would have been like. I mean, there's, you know, the survivor guilt. I'm sure some of the players certainly have that, Um, you know, and then to go on and and continue and be, be in the position of some of your buddies that you know died. And the only reason that you got promoted up to that spot is because they died in a plane crash. Yeah. That would just, you know, it would just, it would be devastating. And um, it, it's yeah, a horrible, horrible story. It, what, what's just amazing to me, you know, it, 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 I, I always pondered dark things as a child, if, if you hadn't figured that out already. But uh, this, you know, when I'm a kid, there's no Wikipedia. There's no internet. There's no way of looking shit up like this to go, I wonder if that's ever happened. There's encyclopedias, but you have to know what you're looking for, too. Um, And uh, I'd always wondered um, in my mind, uh, thinking of all the sports teams that travel all over. And my thought was, I wonder why, you know, logistically, odds wise, there has there not been a plane crash that's like taken out a team before? Uh, Yes, there had. In fact, I I was just completely unaware of these things. But even more strange about that is the fact that this thing happened. uh, The Marshall and the Wichita State uh, crashes 40 days apart. Two college football teams. Marshall plane crash. Yeah. That's not in my memory. Thank God. And I, I guess the Marshall, if I'm correct, I believe there was a, a bit more, a few more fatalities in there. And I, I think it was um, overshadowed a bit. Uh, it overshadowed the Wichita State one uh, in, in time just because it, it happened so, uh, you know, for, so close to the original time. Um, yeah, in fact, it was funny. We were just talking on the other program, Real Ghost Stories Online, before recording this. Um, when I decided on on this as our topic today... I just kind of picked it out of the air. I was trying to think of something that has happened in one of the cities that either one of us lived in or lived in. Um, and I thought, oh, the Wichita State, the football team, that would be an interesting story to, to talk about. Um, just out of nowhere, I, I thought of that. And then right as we're about to do the show, a friend of ours uh, who's a, uh, an anchor uh, on Fox in Denver, uh, Jeremy Hubbard, uh, posts on his timeline, a news story that he just released on it tonight. Uh, it was looking back. Um, I believe it was called overshadowed um, uh, of this uh, story. So if you want to go uh, find out more about that and yeah, what and I want to watch that. Yeah, I, I do too. It, what I was unaware of um, about this, uh, this thing 
uh, the Wichita State crash is that you can still, if you wanted to, hike over to see it, I guess. The, the, this crash occurred in 1970, 50 years ago now. But the plane remnants are still very much there. If you were just coming across this, you'd be like, oh my God, a, a wreck site. But then you start to see there's memorials and stuff that people have put up there, like football helmets and such. But for a wreck site that's 50 years old, I just saw some very recent pictures and was amazed at like what is just still sitting there on the side of this mountain. Maybe it's very difficult to get to. I don't know. That's my guess, which is why it's still there. Yeah. And that people haven't walked off with parts of it because people yeah, do shit like it that. Really hard to get that. Yeah. And you would have had to left it. And I imagine now, you know, plane crash in the mountains. That, that would be impossible to get it apart and bring it, take yeah. it someplace else. I'm always fascinated by that. Things that are left after an accident because not because, you know, you want to, but because you have no choice. You know, I mean, shipwrecks are that way very much. You know, they're at the bottom of the ocean. But when they're in areas that are a little more attainable than the Titanic, um, you think, oh, they can get that. Sometimes, no, they can't. Another interesting one. It's not a, a plane crash, but the and there probably were ways to do this, but they have never done it. Uh, it is the train uh, from uh, what was the Harrison Ford movie where uh, the train crashes and um, was it like clear and present danger or something or. I I don't remember that i don't recall which one it is but the uh the the train is still there uh the the wreck site is there and it was made for the movie and the train was purposely derailed for the movie back before they did everything with cgi they actually had to derail a train and they derailed the train and it was like okay we derailed the train uh it's really not anywhere where we can get it what do we do and well train's still there <laughs> So sometimes people go and hike to it and you'll find a YouTube video about it every now and then. I, I don't recall which movie it was. It was, I believe, an early 90s uh, action movie. And I'm going to get 20 emails saying what it was, but uh, you can look it up. Let's continue on with this story. And we're going to go into the Marshall story and that plane crash of 1970. Southern Airways Flight 932 was a charter, chartered Southwestern Airways Douglas DC-9 domestic United States commercial jet flight from Sailings Field in Kinston, North Carolina to Huntington Tri-State Airport, Milton J. Ferguson Field near Canova and Credo, West Virginia. At 7.36 p.m. on November 14, 1970, the aircraft crashed into a hill just short of the Tri-State Airport, killing all 75 people on board. And what's been recognized as the worst sports-related related air tragedy in U.S. history. The plane was carrying 37 members of the Marshall University Thundering Herd football team, eight members of the coaching staff, 25 boosters, and five flight crew members. The team was returning home after a 17-14 loss at East Carolina Pirates at Pilkin Stadium in Greenville, North Carolina. At the time, Marshall's athletic teams rarely traveled by plane since most away games were within easy driving distance of the campus. The team originally planned to cancel the flight, but changed plans and chartered the Southern Airways DC-9. The accident is the deadliest tragedy to have affected any sports team in U.S. history. It was the second college football team plane crash in a little over a month, as Wichita State's team planes had collided or crashed in Colorado just 43 days earlier, killing 14 players and 31 people overall. The aircraft and crew was a 95-seat twin-jet twin jet engine Douglas DC-930 with tail registration N97S. The airliner's crew was Captain Frank Abbott, First Staff Officer Jerry Smith, and Flight Attendant Pat Vaught and Charlene Pote. All were qualified for the flight. Another employee of Southern Airways, Danny DC, was aboard the flight to coordinate charter activities. This flight was the only flight that year for the Marshall University football team. Events leading to the crash and the original proposal was to charter the flight that was refused because it would exceed the takeoff limitations of their aircraft. The subsequent negotiations resulted in a reduction of the weight of passengers and baggage, and the charter flight was scheduled. 
The airliner left Stallings Field in Kingston, North Carolina, and the flight proceeded to Huntington without incident. The crew established radio contact with air traffic controllers at 7.23 p.m. with instructions to descend to 5,000 feet. The controllers advised the crew that rain, fog, smoke, and a ragged ceiling were at the airport, making landing more difficult but possible. At 7.34 p.m., the airliner's crew reported passing Tri-State Airport's outer marker. The controller gave them clearance to land. The aircraft began its normal descent after passing the outer marker, but did not arrest its descent and hold altitude at 1,240 feet as required by the assigned instrument approach procedure. Instead, the descent continued for another 300 feet for unknown reasons, apparently without either crew member actually seeing the airport lights or runway. In the transcript of the cockpit communications in the final minutes, the pilots briefly debated that their autopilot had captured for a glide slope descent, although the airport was only equipped with a localizer. The report also noted that the craft approached a refinery in the final 30 seconds before impact, which could have affected a visual illusion produced by the difference in the elevation of the refinery and the airport, which was nearly 300 feet higher than the refinery. And that only after a craft would pass over a few interverting hills, the co-pilot monitoring the altimeter called out, it's beginning to lighten up a little bit on the ground here at 700 feet. We're 200 uh, above the descent vector. And the charter coordinator replied, but it'll be a missed approach. The corresponding flight recorder shows that the craft descended another 220 feet in elevation within these 12 seconds. And the co-pilot calls out 400 and agrees to the pilot they are on the correct approach. In the next second, though, the co-pilot quickly calls out new readings. 100 and 2600. The sound of impact immediately follows. The airliner continued on final approach to Tri-State Airport when it collided with the tops of trees at a hillside of 5,543 feet west of runway 11, now runway 12. The plane burst into flames and created a swath of charred ground 95 feet wide and 279 feet long. According to the official NTSB report, the accident was unsurvivable. The aircraft dipped to the right, almost inverted, and had crashed into a hollow nose first. By the time the plane came to a stop, it was 4,219 feet short of the runway and 275 feet south of the middle marker. Although the airport runway has since been lengthened past its original threshold, making historical measurements more difficult, the NTSB official report provides the accident occurred during the hours of darkness at 38 degrees, 22, 27 north latitude and 82 degrees, 34, 42 west longitude. The report additionally notes most of the fuselage was melted or reduced to a powder-like substance. However, several large pieces were scattered throughout the burned area. The remains of six passengers were never identified. So, absolutely horrible crash. I guess, you know, if, if you're going to go down in a, in a plane, I don't know what I would rather have. And this is a very morbid would you rather. But w would you rather go down and, you know, you survive the crash, but you don't get out, you know, because it's it, the plane has gone fire? Or would you, you know, have that rather have that opportunity to at least try and get out or go down? And it's it's just, you know, you don't even realize you died because it's it's such a, a quick thing. I don't know. That's really horrible to think about. It is. Um, I don't know, because if you have a shot at living, of course you'd want to yeah. survive it. You would, but at the same time, if your odds are, I mean, you wouldn't know this, but. But if I'm on a mountain, yeah. you know, it's like, what am I going to do then? Yeah. I recently watched a documentary on Leonard Skinner and, uh, and their plane crash. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of a, uh, it reminded me of the Wichita State plane crash and that there was a lot of error. And I think there's things that could have happened 
differently and the band would have made it and sure. the other people. Sure. But, um, but the, one of the women, the backup singers who survived was talking about surviving, but how horribly injured she was. Yeah. What it was like to be in the plane crash after it had crashed. Yeah. And waiting for someone to help or trying to figure out what had happened and who was where and they're upside down. And I, I could, I couldn't imagine. No. That I had, I mean, I can't like that plane crash. That is horrific. That to me is just is horrific. I, if I had to like rank, you know, everybody has like, you know, your, your fears of dying or like your worst ways to die. Uh, you know, obviously you could get pretty gross and you could go into some really horrific shit. But like, if you're just talking, I guess, vehicle crashes or something of the, the sort, you're talking, you know, fire, drowning, plane crash, things of that nature. I'm not going to go into like execution terrorist style shit, but uh, if we're talking things like that. Um, I think plane crash ranks right up there as one of the scariest for me that I... I hate flying. I I do fly, but I, I've never like not flown out of fear. But I do not enjoy it. I I really I have not flown uh, since about a year ago, and that was the one of the worst flights I had because we couldn't land in the city we were supposed to. We were running out of fuel. We actually landed in the Carolinas. Uh, in during a, a storm and had horrible turbulence and just constant thunder and lightning. And it was just the worst flight ever. And uh, I landed there and eventually had to go rent a car to get to my original destination. Say, you ended yeah. up driving part of that, if I yeah, remember. Yeah, because right. I was supposed to be in Lexington for a live show uh, with another podcast, uh, Hillbilly Horror Stories. Uh, the following day. And so I thought I'm going to buy a plane ticket because it was like an eight hour drive from Branson where we were. I thought I'll just take a plane. And it was a, it was a connector. Fl it, it, it was a connector flight, but we never landed where we were supposed to connect. So and there was no more outgoing flight. So I ended up having to make an eight hour drive turn into a 16 hour drive because I had to drive eight back the other way from the coast I, after landing on the East Coast. And I had to go back inland eight hours, got to where I needed to go and then eight back to the center of the country. So it was an inadvertent drive halfway across the USA weekend for me. Uh, but uh, <laughs> made the show. So that's a good thing. But um yeah, I mean, it was that was the last time I flew and it was horrible. And I, you know, there's just I, I don't know what it'd be like flying during all of this right now, but it's nowhere near on the top of my list to do anytime soon. Like in I, I just find that so it's it's interesting to me because of going to Wichita State and knowing the history with that, that never no one ever mentioned to me or if they did, I didn't remember it, that there was another even more horrific plane crash what was it 40 days later 43 yeah wow i had no idea yeah back to back um was it was there not a uh, a movie about this that was made several years back was it we are marshall or something if i remember correctly i'm horrible on movies <laughs> i don't think that was about this was it not about this was that about something else or maybe it was i don't re maybe it was a quick Google could answer that. I will just uh, Google that. I believe, yeah, it was. It was. It was okay. about the aftermath. It was about the aftermath of the 1970 plane crash that killed 75 people. Um, it was about 75 people. It was about what happened after and how they uh, how they kind of coped with everything because it was how horrible that it, it was obviously yeah i i think i i don't know i don't i i'm i have no memory if i saw this or not i couldn't tell you what i did last week so <laughs> there you go well, and then it's their only flight yeah. of the whole season yep the rest of it i'm assuming was in buses yeah i mean just <sighs> your one time and probably for many of the kids maybe maybe one of their first flights too you know ever and yeah, and the 70s, you sure didn't fly like you do today. Yeah, that's just uh, continuing on with the uh, the story. We'll uh, jump into the investigation and what was found out to have uh, occurred on that horrific flight in 1970.
The NTSB investigated the accident and its final report was issued on April 14, 1972. In the report, the NTSB concluded the accident was the result of a descent below minimum descent altitude during a non-prescription approach under adverse operating conditions without visual contact with the runway environment. They further stated the board has not been able to determine the reason for the greater descent, although the two most likely explanations are an improper use of cockpit instrumentation data or an altimetry system error. At least one source says that water that had seeped into the plane's altimeter could have thrown off its height readings, leading the pilots to believe the plane was higher than it was actually the case. The board made three recommendations as a result of the accident, including recommendations for heads-up displays, ground proximity warning devices, and surveillance and inspection of in-flight operations. On November 15, 1970, a memorial service was held at the indoor 8,500-seat Veterans Memorial Fieldhouse with moments of silence, remembrances, and prayers. The following Saturday, another memorial service was held at the outdoor 18,000-seat Fairfield Stadium across the nation. Many expressed their condolences, classes at Marshall, along with numerous events and shows by the Marshall Artist Series and the football team's game against the Ohio Bobcats were canceled and government offices were closed. A mass funeral was held at the field house and many of the dead were buried at the Spring Hill Cemetery, some together because bodies were not identifiable. The effects of the crash on Huntington went far beyond the Marshall campus because it was the herd's only charter flight of the season. Boosters and prominent citizens were on the plane, the plane including a city councilman, a state legislator, and four physicians. Seventy children lost at least one parent in the crash, with 18 of them left orphaned. The crash of flight 932 so devastated the local community that it almost led to the discontinuation of Marshall's football pl- program. New coach Jack Lingle, Marshall University students, and Thundering Herd football fans convinced acting Marshall President Donald N. Dedman to reconsider canceling the program in late 1970. In the weeks afterward, Lengel was aided in his attempts by receivers coach Red Dawson. Dawson was a coach in the previous staff who had driven back from East Carolina game along with Gail Parker, a a freshman coach. Parker flew to the game but did not fly back having switched planes with Deke at Brackett, another coach. Dawson and Parker were buying boiled peanuts at a country store in the rural Virginia when they heard the news over the radio. Before the trip, they were scheduled to go on a recruiting mission to Firm College after the ECU Marshall game in an effort to recruit recruit Billy Joe uh, Man, uh, Mantooth, who eventually transferred to WVU instead. After the crash, Red Dawson helped bring together a group of players who were in their junior varsity football team during the 1970 season, as well as students and athletes from other sports to form a 1971 team. Many had never played football before. Head coach Rick Tolley was among the crash victims. Jack Lingle was named to take Tolley's place on March 12, 1971, after Dick Bestwick, the first choice for the job, backed out after just one week and returned to Georgia Tech. Lingle, who came from a coaching job at the College of Wooster, was hired recently, was hired by recently hired athletic director Joe McMullen. Lingle played for McMullen at the University of Akron in the 1950s. The Marshall University football team only won two games during the 1971 season against Xavier and Bowling Green. Lingo led the Thundering Herd to a 9-33 record during his tenure, which ended after the 1974 season. So it wasn't quite like you'd see made out in a fake made-for-TV movie where suddenly it's the best team in the world. No, it, it, it... It doesn't turn out that great, but the fact that they had the spirit and they had the drive to continue the legacy is, is really what was the, 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 the point of the story there. Yeah. I think more than winning or losing, it was about persevering. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, but yeah, what a a horrible tragedy to back to back to have uh, occurred. People at that point, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you'd almost be wondering what the hell is going on with two football plane crashes back to back like that. And then, uh, I mean, I don't, it's not like there was a rash of them. It was like two, boom, yeah. boom. Yeah. 
That's just, oh, I had no idea. Yeah, but enough to say, that's odd. Um, and luckily, it, it did not continue. But, yeah, it was just uh, nothing you want to uh, obviously have occur to anyone that you love. And horrible to hear about everything that happened there. All the, the orphan children, all the people uh, yeah, af- affected. And then something like that, there's so it affects so many people. It's such a long trail of people it affects. Yeah. And for a long time, generations. Yeah, you know? to this day, obviously, and you know, yeah. fifty years ago, but obviously, something that still, you know, uh, the the wounds, you know, they they live on. So there you go. That's going to wrap up today's episode of the dark side of Wikipedia as we looked at the football plane tragedies, the two back to back tragedies of nineteen seventy. Until next time, for Carol and all of us at the dark side of Wikipedia. Be sure to press subscribe wherever you listen to the show. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.